Hi, I'm Ken Werlein, founding pastor at FaithBridge, and I'm with Pastor Dan Slagle, who has a great word for us today, kicking off a new series we're calling The Things That Keep Us Up At Night. After listening to the message, I hope you'll stick around for a few minutes because we're going to do a postscript. Just a little chat that he and I are going to have, taking a few questions and dealing a little bit more in depth with the things of worry, anxiety, and even depression. So stay with us. You'll enjoy the message. Let's take a look now. Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. We are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. I want to extend a special word of welcome if you are one of the 153 people who last week took the Come, Look, and Listen Challenge. 30-day challenge to come and just find out, is God all who He is cracked up to be? All we make Him out to be anyway. If you're here, we're really glad that you're here. We're praying for you and we're trusting that God is going to meet you in a special way. Today we're beginning a brand new sermon series that we're calling Things That Keep You Up At Night. Isn't it strange how things always are so much worse at nighttime? I mean, I don't know what it is. If it's it's just the the absence of light and stepping into the darkness, Uh, I don't know if it's the fact that it's at nighttime that we finally slow down enough to really hone in on something worth worrying about, but everything gets bigger and badder and meaner, much scarier at nighttime. But, of course, worry is uh, equal opportunity. Just as apt to come after us in the daytime as it is in the nighttime. And neither is worry any respecter of persons. Worry is no respecter of age, gender, station in life, season of life. It's apt to come on us at any time. When we're in high school, we worry about getting a date, getting into the right college. When we're in college, we worry, hopefully, about getting a job after college and getting out of the nest. When we're a young adult, we're worried about, will marriage be a part of my life? Will I find that right person? Then if we do find that right person, and we think about starting a family, we worry, will that be a part of our lives? And if children should come, then all bets are off, friends. You have just become a professional worrier for the rest of your life. And then as the kids grow up and begin to move on, an empty nest is approaching, we worry, what what are we going to do? Are we going to just sit here and look at each other? What have we been doing all these years? that they were here. And on into our senior years, we wonder and worry, have I saved enough for retirement? What about health issues? Yeah, worry is always at the doorstep, ready. None of us are immune. And of course, for some of us, worry is is much, much more serious than something that simply keeps us up at night. In fact, Here at the start of this message, I I wanted to be sure and take a moment of pastoral privilege as your care pastor and and say something to those of you for whom worry is more than something that keeps you up at night. It, It actually is debilitating. One author I read said that worry expresses itself in any number of ways. If it expresses itself psychologically, we call that anxiety If it expresses itself physically, we call that stress. And there are those among us whose lives are being crushed and ruined by anxiety and stress. And if that's you, I want to give you a word of encouragement, and it's this. Get help. You don't have to live with it. There are trained professionals out there who can come alongside you and give you counsel and guidance and coaching about how to deal with stress and anxiety. There is medication and there's no shame in taking it. As I've mentioned to you on several occasions before, both Pastor Ken and myself have benefited greatly from counseling. We have benefited greatly from medication. 
Don't deny yourself the opportunity to find that healing if worry and stress have reached huge proportions in your life. But whether the issues are great or small, worry is apt to come after all of us. That's why I think Jesus spoke so directly to the issue. Why Jesus had such strong words to say about it. In just a moment, we're going to look at what Jesus had to say. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. If you want to go ahead and be turning there in your Bibles, our ushers are coming down the aisle. If you need a Bible, please Take one from them. Consider that a gift from Faith Bridge to you if you do not presently own a Bible. We'll be in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 25. Before we start reading that passage, though, I I wanted to take just a moment and consider where does this thing called worry come from in the first place? Why why is it that we're so prone to it? And, And where does it come sneaking up from to get us? And I think I can best explain it by telling you a story. Some years ago, my wife Becky and I uh, decided to celebrate our anniversary by taking a trip to Alaska. Beautiful, pristine mountains, wilderness, rivers, and lakes. It was a fantastic trip. And it was one of those kind of trips where once you got there, uh, there was a selection of things to do for every day of the time that you were there. And on one particular day, I decided to take advantage of a trail ride. It was an opportunity to go horseback riding up into the mountains and to get an up-close and personal look at things that you just couldn't see if you were limited to your car or what have you. Becky didn't care anything about it, so she went shopping. (laughs) Now, uh, I am no horse whisperer. I can count the times on one hand that I have ridden a horse. And so when I got to the corral and the wrangler asks, okay, who among us is not experienced with horses? My hand goes right up. And he very graciously took some time to explain to me, you know, some of the basics. This is the side that you get up on the horse. And once you get up there, this is how we stop and how we go to the right and the left and on and on and on. Grateful for all of the instruction. When he finished teaching me, there was a fellow vacationer, a lady, who decided that she was going to be his co-wrangler. And she turned to me and began to instruct me as well in the finer points of horseback riding. And I will never forget the last thing that she said to me. She said, now here's the most important thing. You never let the horse forget that you are in charge. Never let that horse forget you are in charge. Okay. So we take off. And it was fantastic. We're just loping along, and he took us miles and miles back into the mountains, and we saw absolutely beautiful things, things that I could not have seen otherwise. Lots and lots of great pictures. Stopped and had some lunch, and then we began to make our way back. And as we're making our way back, we came to a sort of a long, flat stretch, and the wrangler said... He didn't say that. But the wrangler said... Well, folks, y'all, y'all want to take him for a trot? Okay, sure, let's, let, let's go. So we take off, and it's not like the Kentucky Derby. I mean, we're just, you know, we're not flying, but we're moving along at a pretty good pace, and it's kind of fun, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm at the back, all of a sudden, from towards the front, I begin to hear someone screaming. And as I'm looking up to see what's going on, I realize it's the co-wrangler. It's the lady who admonished me, never let the horse forget. Well, apparently her horse forgot. (laughs) Because he took off like a bolt of thunder. And at the same time, her saddle began to come loose. And she is slowly drifting off (laughs) to the side until she is practically parallel with the ground, screaming thinking that the horse will somehow begin to understand English as she screams, stop, stop, stop. Well, thankfully, the wrangler quickly saw what was going on, came back, rescued, saved the day, all was good. Now, what caused all of the worry and anxiety for that lady? The fact that she was not in control. That's where worry comes from. 
the realization that we are not in control of anything. We live with an illusion that we are in control until something happens to remind us that we're not. We think we're in control of our health and the economy and our children and whatever else you want to fill in the blank. And then we get a precious reminder. <laughs> We're not in control of a doggone thing. <laughs> and it's that realization that brings about the worry and the anxiety and the stress. Jesus knew about our proclivity to worry. And so in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning at verse 25... He said these words, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word, both the living word, your son Jesus Christ, and the written word, your holy scriptures. We pray as we turn our attention now to the written word, that your Holy Spirit would come as you promised, to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. So Jesus begins his words about worry with the word, therefore. And I was taught in seminary, anytime you see the word therefore, you need to stop and ponder what is it there for. In other words, what has gone on before it that would provoke Jesus to say therefore? And what has been taking place immediately before these words is Jesus talking to his listeners about the choice we all have to make in life, the choice of our master. Our master in life will either be God or it will be something else. He chose money because that is frequently a master for many of us. But there are any number of things that we can put our faith in, that we can put our trust in to deliver us from difficult times and from worry. But Jesus makes the case that God is clearly the superior choice. If you put your faith in something else, well, best of luck to you. But if you choose to make God your master. There are certain things that you can be sure of regarding worry. And in the passage we just read, Jesus lifts up three truths about worry that we can hold on to, that we can cling to if we have made God our master and we are resting in Him. And the first of those is to remember that God loves you. The first step in dealing effectively with worry is to remember that God loves you. That's what those first verses from verses 25 to 31 where Jesus is talking about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. The point of that whole comparison is to underscore and highlight the fact that God loves us. If He provides for birds and provides for flowers which do nothing by way of toiling or spinning, and yet every need they have is met, will He not 
much more provide for you the crown of His creation? In Psalm 8, the psalmist refers to humanity, human beings, men and women, boys and girls, as the crown of God's creation. If He's going to look after birds and flowers, you can bet He's going to look after you. Despite the fact that the love of God is one of His characteristics that we absolutely cherish the most, it is so quickly the first one that we forget. And typically when we get worried, we begin to doubt more and more just how much God loves us. The worry has a way of overshadowing that love and calling it into question in the first place. Our eldest, uh, Georgia is her name, is a student at Asbury University. And for a whole lot of reasons, this, this was a trying year for her. Lots of opportunities for worry. And it was reaching the point where she began to question many things. She began to question the love of God, His concern for her, His availability to her. There were more than one night where she cried out to God, Are you there? Do you even remember that I exist? Well, at Asbury, students uh, go to chapel. And on a particular morning, Georgia woke up. It was raining outside. She looked out the window and thought, Ah, I'm not sure chapel is what I want to do today. It's such a messy day. But then thought better of it, put on her yellow raincoat, trudged across campus. And she said, Dad, I'm so glad that I went because the lady who spoke was just awesome. She gave one of the most incredible talks that I've ever heard. It was so good that when it was over, I wanted to go down front and tell her how much I appreciated it. Well, I got down there and a, a line of students had already formed and I'm waiting my turn and I'm looking at my watch thinking I'm going to be late for class. I just, I don't know. And I almost walked away when suddenly the last student finished and there we were face to face. And she said, Dad, this lady looked at me and said, Oh my goodness, you're here! And Georgia said, she looked over her shoulder like, Who? God told me that you were going to be here. And he has a message for you, sweet girl. He knows you. He's not forgotten you, and he loves you. He said, she said, listen, I, I know you're going to run off to class, but if you would, give me just a moment. I, I want to greet two or three other students, but then when I'm done, I need to show you my journal entry from this morning. So she finished up her greeting, and then she came over to Georgia, and she's thumbing through her journal, and she opened her journal up and showed her this. The picture she had written in her journal that morning, she will be there. Tell her I know her deeply, intimately, personally. I know her. Look for the girl with the bright yellow top. She needs to know I know her. God loves us. He wants us to know that He loves us. And if we're going to take steps in dealing with the worry that afflicts all of our lives, step number one is remembering God loves me. Not only do we have to remember that God loves us, but number two, we have to refrain from worthless pursuits. Jesus says, don't go running after things like the pagans do. That word pagan refers to to people who don't know God. That's what a pagan is. Someone who doesn't know God and has no relationship with God. And so Jesus says, if God is your master, if you've given your life to Him, don't behave like those who don't know Him. Because you're missing out. The moment you begin to act as though you don't know who He is, it's your relationship with Him that is the source of your peace and your love and your comfort as you cultivate and grow in your relationship with Him, that's where the peace comes from. But as long as you pretend and act as though there is no God, there will be no peace. This year, um, dawned on me just the other day, uh, Pastor Ken and I have been friends for 30 years. We met back in 1989 in seminary. And for 17 of those years, I've, I've worked for him here at 
at Faith Bridge. And I, I, I think by any measure, it would be safe to say, I, I know Pastor Ken. And one of the many things that I know about Pastor Ken is that he is reliable. He's trustworthy. I can depend on him. If he tells me he's going to do something for me, I don't stay up at night wringing my hands and wondering, is he going to come through? No, because of my relationship with Pastor Ken, because of my history with him, and because he's demonstrated time after time after time, he is a reliable, loyal, trustworthy friend. I have peace about the things that he says he will do for me. And the same principle holds true in our relationship with God. The longer we journey with Him, the more we get to know Him, the more we begin to see He is as good as His Word. He is completely reliable, more reliable even than Pastor Ken. But as long as we're out there running, running, I find that word running interesting. Actually, in the Greek, it refers to a rather obsessive focus or preoccupation. Don't get obsessively focused on things that ultimately don't matter. If you're going to get focused, if you're going to get obsessive about anything, get obsessive about God. Take all of that energy you're expending worrying and pour that into your relationship with Him. And that's the third thing Jesus tells us to do. Not only are we to remember that God loves us and refrain from worthless pursuits, but thirdly, we need to begin pursuing God, His kingdom, and His righteousness. Now let me ask you a question. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but just something for you to think about in your own mind. Let's, let's take a given day, any day. And on the one hand, let's stack up the minutes that we spend worrying about things. And on the other hand, let's stack up the minutes that we spend pursuing God, thinking about Him, allowing Him to fill our hearts and our life with His love and His watch care. On any given day, who's going to win? Well, I have a pretty good notion. God's going to lose just about every time. Our minds tend always to move toward the worry side of the equation, but this is exactly what Jesus is warning us against. If you want to know peace, you have to know God. And in order to know God, you've got to pursue that relationship. You see, being a Christ follower, being a Christian, is not about following rules. It's not about doing spiritual gymnastics. No, it's about relationship. That's what God is fundamentally, primarily concerned about where you're concerned is a growing, life-giving relationship with Him. But so many of us deny ourselves a worry-free life because we're pursuing lesser, infinitely lesser things that at the end of the day really tend only to add to our worries rather than alleviate them. And here's the thing, God has made it so incredibly easy for us to be in relationship with Him. He's given us very particular, special gifts that enhance our walk with Him. He says to us, read about me. I've given you this book that tells you everything that you need to know about me. Spend some time reading it. Talk to me. Tell me what's on your heart and what's on your mind. Tell me about your concerns and your worries. Pray. Spend time with my people. Look, look for people who are pursuing me. And spend time with them so that you can learn from them, so that you can be encouraged by them, so that you can grow not only in your relationship with them, but with me too. That's a pretty simple formula, friends. Read, talk. Hang out. Those are the gifts that God has given us to grow in our relationship with Him. And yet so many of us deny ourselves peace that is there for the asking because we'd rather watch TV. 
We'd rather go to ball games. We'd rather spend time worrying. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with TV or ball games, but friends, when the one who created you and the one who loves you and the source of your life has extended you an opportunity to have peace, how foolish we are to try and substitute something else in His place. If you and I want to have peace, we need to remember that God loves us and quit wasting our time running after things that don't bear any fruit other than more worry and instead take all of that energy and all of that time that we devote toward worry and pursuit of worthless things and begin to pursue God. It's in our knowledge of Him and in our relationship with Him that peace comes. The greatest proof we have that God cares about us is the single fact that He has addressed our greatest worry ever. And our greatest worry, whether you're aware of it or not, is that we have disconnected ourselves from God. You know, God created us and He is the source of life. The only reason we have any life at all is because of Him and His graciousness to us. But all of us in our own individual ways have said to God, no thanks. I want to live life my way. I want to do things on my terms. And we have disconnected ourselves from the source of life. And there is no hope because you and I do not have the ability to be self-sustaining. Not in this life and not in the next. But because He loves us, God pursued us first. And in the person of Jesus, He came after us to meet our greatest worry. Death. Eternal death. And on the last night of His earthly life, Jesus gathered His disciples with Him. And He wanted to give them some, something tangible, something they could hold on to and something they could practice on a regular basis to be reminded of how much He loves them. And so he took a cup filled with wine and he held it before them and he said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me, remembering how much I love you. I want you to remember that my blood is about to be poured out for you for the, gift, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he took some bread and he held it up before them and he said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. I want you to remember that my body will be broken, that I will die for you. And each time you partake of this wine and this bread, let it bring back to you the fact that I have not forgotten about you, that I love you, that you are the crown of my creation, and that I will go to any length necessary to restore you to me and bring you peace that passes understanding. And so we thought it would be fitting on the first Sunday of this sermon series to have a tangible reminder that God loves us because that is the foundation of the fortress against worry, His great love. In just a moment, in both of our rooms, west and east, our ushers are going to guide us down to stations at the front let me say a few words about how we celebrate the Lord's Supper here at Faith Bridge. As you approach the stations, you're going to find some gluten-free wafers and a cup of grape juice. You'll take the wafer and you will dip it into the cup, what is called intinction, and then partake. We have an open table here at Faith Bridge. That is to say, if you have a relationship with Jesus or you would like to have one with Him, you're welcome to come and celebrate His Supper. Once you have partaken, you are welcome to stay and pray if you need to. We'll have some uh, prayer partners here. Uh, or return to your seat. We would ask that throughout this celebration, uh, you please remain 
with us in an attitude of prayer and worship for the benefit of those who are still partaking. And then we will close our service in song together. Worry is an unavoidable part of the human experience. But it doesn't have to dominate our lives. Jesus came to set us free. And when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for loving us enough that you came after us. You didn't leave us to our own devices. The fact is we have no devices. Apart from you, we are nothing. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us, to shed his blood and to have his body broken, that we might be forgiven and restored to relationship with you. We pray now you would bless this juice and bless these wafers. May they be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. And may this time serve as a means of grace, restoring to us peace that passes understanding. And we offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Won't you please come as the ushers lead? Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi everybody, I'm Ken Werlein, founding pastor at FaithBridge, and this is Postscript. Just an opportunity for us to talk a minute after the sermon with Pastor Dan, who started our new series, The Things That Keep Me Up at Night, with a great word about worry. Thank you for that. Thank you. So we had, uh, we had one question that was texted in that probably represents any number of thoughts that came through um, in people's minds. And then I wanna talk about one other thing. Okay. So, so let me read the question. The question says, Good message. I'm struggling with feeling I always will be provided for, and then that others will always be provided for, what you were saying in the passage. Because the passage referencing God providing for the birds and the plants sometimes feels to me not to be always true. I think of animals and plants and people who die from starvation or not being provided for, and it's hard, and it's scary to trust among homeless, homelessness, abuse, neglect, even malpractice by doctors that we rely on. Can you please offer your thoughts on this? How do you bring that together with what you were talking about? Yeah, good question, and one that many, many people have wrestled with over the years. I think the best response I've come across, I'll give credit to John R.W. Stott, biblical scholar from the UK. He points out that uh, Jesus' promise of provision in this passage is not co-equal with or the same thing as uh, a promise of protection from all harm. Uh, we live in a sinful, broken world. Bad things happen to good people. But God can be relied upon to provide us not only food and clothing when that is the need, but even in the midst of our suffering, God provides what we need. If, if grace is what we need to get through it, if stamina is what we need, if trust in Him is what we need, uh, as we've seen in martyrs and Christians around the world today even yeah. who are suffering, uh, God comes along and in the moment of need provides. Uh, so I, I think we do the scripture a disservice if we hone in strictly on the meeting of physical needs, I think Jesus' message is much broader. I'll buy that. I would also add, uh, I'm thinking to any number of mission trips, cross-cultural mission trips that I have taken, um, you've probably taken five times as many, I'm sure that you've had the experience I've had. You get outside of America 
and you get into uh, poor and poor cultures, what do you discover? Joy. That's the funny thing. Oh, absolutely. You think we're going to bring the joy of the Lord yeah. to these poor little urchin people, and you get over there. They bring it to us. They bring it to us. Yeah. They know a joy that we don't know of. That's true. And I'm afraid uh, maybe that, that any number of us inclined to wrestle with this sort of question do get a little bit jaded by our American worldview. Yeah. Uh, and which tends to always compare up with people who have it better than compare down. And you see, my gosh, these people know and love God more and better than, than <laughs> yes. we do. I've had that thought far too many times. Exactly. Yeah. Well, all right. So one of the reasons that I wanted to sit in the host chair uh, on this talk about anxiety and worry that you did a great job on is because you mentioned me. Okay. And particularly, <laughs> not so much our friendship, but you mentioned the medication. Yeah. And which is indeed nothing that you and I have ever uh, denied. Why don't you talk about it and then I'll chime in sure. as well. Yeah. So in the years leading up to our transition to Faith Bridge, 17 years ago, and immediately following, that would have been from about 2000 to 2004, thereabouts, uh, I began to deal with stress and anxiety uh, expressed through depression. Hmm. Um, I was sinking into places I had never been before and really didn't know what was going on, what to do about it. And I'll give credit to my wife. She's the one who pointed out, you know, y you need to see somebody. This, this is bigger than, than you. And so I did get in to see someone and had some excellent counseling. And eventually we decided that, that medication was necessary. And I went on Wellbutrin, which I have been on since. And it has made all the difference in the world for me. Yeah. Uh, I don't foresee me ever going off. I hope they never stop making it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Uh, because well. my brain just doesn't produce what Wellbutrin provides. Right, right, exactly. Well, similarly, in 2004, when Suzanne was pregnant with Wesley, I was raising the money to, to build our first phase, I began having panic attacks. Mm, like dropping off the ledge. Yeah, one time we were in a car and I was driving, I started crying and you're like, watch you pull over. <laughs> and I really was coming unglued. Yeah. And similarly, uh, my doctor said, I think we need to try what's called an SSRI medication mm -hmm. for you. And uh, that's like Lexapro, Zoloft, Prozac, those. And within a month, I wasn't terrified. I wasn't afraid I was dying. And in those loops, every 30 seconds that I just couldn't break out of, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. It just kept coming back. And so I always tell people without reservation, I look upon medication that Dr. Solomon gives me mm -hmm. for my heart right. is a gift from God. And I look upon my medication that the doctor gives me for my brain as a gift from God as well. I don't know why we uh, tend to think somehow that that's a lesser thing that, well, you, sh you, you can treat this organ and you can treat that organ yeah. and you can treat that, but you, you never want to treat the brain. But I think we do. Yeah. And I remember my counselor, uh, I, I was talking about the stigma, especially as a pastor. Yeah, you know? right. And at the time, I wore glasses all the time. Mm -hmm. Hadn't had my eyes fixed yet. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, Dan, what's that on your nose? These? He said, yes. He said, are you ashamed to have those out there for the whole world to see? I said, no. And he said, well, why do you wear them? Because my eyes don't work. Exactly. Mm, that's good. And there's a part of your brain that doesn't work. Yeah. So you shouldn't feel bad yeah. about it. It's yeah. just... Yeah. Which I might also add one other thought, then we're done. Um, and that is when we take this type of medication, it is a help. It doesn't fix. Right. We still wrestle with worry. Sure. But the way I describe it to people is it just feels like for once the playing field has been leveled. Yes. And now at least I take it on uh, 
with the potential strength and everything that other brothers and sisters are taking it on yeah. with, where if I'm not on it, I, I really do. Behind I, the eight ball, I'm way yeah. behind, and yeah. no matter how much I pray, I can get in these uh, little weird loops, and so I'm very grateful. Amen. Great word today. Thanks. Great kickoff for the series. I'm excited to continue it uh, next Sunday as we continue to talk about the things that keep us up at night. And so we'll see you then next Sunday. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.